Uh, thank you, madam. Um, I got that, right. Um, it's a, uh, basically a collection that's been building slowly and um, the most recent addition, uh, addition to it is actually on its way to me now, um, but it hasn't arrived in time to be added to this. The reason uh, viaducts, of course, well, why did I collect viaducts? It's pretty obvious that that is one. And uh, the reason behind the whole thing is that I'm one of those people who, uh, when they look back, realize that uh, many of your collecting in interests uh, come about because of your past. I lived, uh, I was born and lived in a place uh, which had many hills. So there were many bridges and that included one viaduct, which was in within walking distance of our house. <clears throat> so in the summer months, beautiful day like this, we go down to the viaduct um, and you will see that one. I have been to this one as well, but I'm not telling you about that one because you might actually recognize it. Uh, so what's a viaduct? Well, you all know that because you're intelligent people. Um, but just so as to be absolutely clear, because Barry didn't, because he talked about aqueducts to me. Um, <clears throat> the definition from the OED is a long bridge-like structure, typically a series of arches and so on. And it must be carrying a road or a railway. <clears throat> so that makes it, and that of course is because it came from the Latin via and ducere to a way which brings or guides. So it's very much like an aqueduct, which has the same uh, final route, but of course the first bit is water. So where shall we start? Well, we'll start with the Ravenshaw Viaduct. None of you will have heard of that. It's also known as Ravenshaw Arches, which is fine. Um, but since you don't know where it is, I'll start off by showing you, he said. Come on thing, behave yourself. And there's Ravenshaw, <clears throat> just outside a small place called Haslingdon, down from Burnley, up from Manchester. That's in the sense of down being south, up being north. Um, and Manchester was where I went to school and a railway line ran down here from Blackburn across to Accrington, from Burnley down to Accrington, and then all the way down to Manchester. And the first viaduct that I really knew about <laughs> was that one. Um, so the postcard that we've got here is a nice uh, early one. You can tell that from many things such as the train, um, definitely a local railway setup, the carriages which could only be described as archaic. But um, down below, if you look down there, there are the group of people that we can see. Um, if I can persuade my system to show them larger. And you can see a little group of people along by the rather, the rather insignificant River Ogden. Well, this viaduct is the one that we came down to when I was a youngster in the 1950s or slightly early sometimes. The only problem is it didn't look like that. It was built in somewhere around uh, about the 1830, 1838, when the line was built up from um, Manchester to Passbury and up to Accrington, the Accrington branch. Uh, and that um, was the uh, viaduct was built to cross the River Ogden, which is a tributary of the Irwell. If you know anything about the rivers of Lancashire, you will know that they uh, hosted cotton mills and bleach mills and upstream from this were both many cotton mills and at least one bleach mill because my father worked at the bleach mill. They were less careful with their effluent than they are these days so when we came down here in the 1950s you didn't go in the stream, you didn't go into the river at all because if you did you would be in a very polluted um, set, uh, water course. Um, it was brown, it was frothy, it decided it, it looked like, um, <clears throat> you know what's left after the uh, snow has uh, become mushy and melted and um, but has all the grit in it, well it was worse than that. 
um, and it really was quite unpleasant. Nowadays, of course, it's a little bit different and it's just as well. I'm having slight problems, which I don't understand, but never mind. Now it looks like that. Um, this is the pattern, by the way, that I shall be following each time. I say why it was built and so on and so forth, and the, show a map of where it is and how the postcard that engendered this. And then here we've got um, something, a photograph, uh, usually pinched from the um, websites, but this is now, a, it's actually a protected uh, archway, but you'll notice that it no longer has a parapet. If you tried walking across there, um, you'd have to have a good sense of balance. And here now is the stream back to how it used to be because either they've cleaned up or as in fact is the case for most of them, all the um, uh, mills have closed down. So we'll stay in North York, uh, in the North rather. Um, we'll go to the Sankey Viaduct. You might have heard of this one. <clears throat> it's the earliest major railway viaduct in the world. This has been di disputed by somebody who said, no, the one on the Stockton and Darlington is earlier, but I don't count that as being a major railway viaduct. So tough. And I'm in charge tonight, sort of. Um, here it is. And in case you hadn't realized, it's on the Liverpool to Manchester railway line, which is just a bit important in the history of railways. <clears throat> and that's how it looked. <clears throat> As it says, railways in the 30s, this is not an actual photograph, uh, a postcard as taken, but a sketch has done by somebody um, soon after it was built. It's a fascinating one, and the history of it is incredibly fascinating to me. It was built between, uh, as it says down at the bottom, between 18... 20 and 1830, um, and the arches were over the um, Sankey Brook and Canal. The <clears throat> canal itself was, ob uh, sorry, the um, viaduct itself and the railway were objected to by the uh, canal owners, and they insisted that it must be high enough so that the barges could go pass through with their sails up. So it was built at a sufficient height but the ground either side wasn't high enough for that. So in fact, they had to build it so that it rose up in order to pass over this and then uh, fall down the other side or go down a slope on the other side. So this is one of those rare situations where the viaduct has had to be actually considerably higher than the land on either side. Um, the uh, architect of the whole thing was of course Stevenson and co. Um, but he appointed to do this, a very young architect. Um, in fact, he was 19 when he built this. Can you imagine a 19 year old being asked to do a bridge um, in these circumstances? Well, he not only did it, but he did it successfully. And of course, we've got an ancient uh, rail, um, train, railway train on top. Uh, I don't suppose it's rocket. Now it looks like that. In other words, it's still in use. Um, yes, it's needed to have some repairs done, but no, it hasn't needed to be completely rebuilt. Um, and now, it, of course, it's carrying extremely important, very fast and somewhat heavier trains than it was before. And the canal, well, the canal's gone. <clears throat> the brook is still there, um, but the much of the canal was in fact coming through, I think here, um, uh, some would be traveling on that side possibly as well, or even further over on there, I'm not sure. I haven't been down to this, but this is the brook that's left and the rest has gone. In fact, it didn't take very long after that before the canal became irrelevant because of course other railways were built. So the earliest major railway viaduct in the world and still going strong. They built a well in Lancashire. You'll gather that's where I'm from. Next one, well, another part of my history, uh, Monsell Dale Viaduct, also known as the Headstone Viaduct. And this one is in the Dales, the Derbyshire Dales. So we're still in the north. Um, Buxton and Co is somewhere up here. And this was uh, a railway that was coming down this sort of line. 
I'm not sure where it carried on through from there. Um, but there's the Monsell uh, Dale Viaduct pointer. And that's the um, one of the um, postcards that I've got of this. The viaduct at Monsell Head. Train on it, of course, because you have got to have that. And this is one that was built by uh, a railway company, obviously. And what it was aiming to do was to uh, take um, some of the traffic to gain some of the traffic between Manchester and London. So it was the Midlands Railway, uh, London Midlands Railway that was trying to build this <coughs> or did build this. And their aim was to open up the Dales as well because they knew that there were, again, cotton mills inside the Dale at um, Crompton. And they also knew that there was stone that could be used for building purposes uh, in Manchester or in London, it didn't matter which way it went, they were quite happy for it to go either way. So this one was uh, uh, built for a very real commercial purpose. There was an enormous objection to it being built. It had to pass through, I don't know how many uh, attempts and acts in um, parliament in order to be successful. Then once it had been built and then managed it, another company wanted to build another viaduct, not in this same line, but actually coming across and going above it from this side of the valley to this side of the valley, crossing the lower one. I think it's probably as well they didn't build that one. Um, I'm not sure that they would have managed it. It wasn't intended to um, sort of work against this one, the Monsell head, but I suspect that there would have been major problems on building one that way. But however, these engineers and uh, architects were brave to say the least, but that one didn't run. Get onto the picture again. Don't know why this is not behaving. I'm being polite, a change. Right, so taking the line through, it crosses the River Y, which is the thing I've forgotten to say. And this is how it looks now. <clears throat> it's now a walkway. And the good thing about this one, and the one that I, the reason I put it in um, to my display is that this is one that I have walked over. I've been on there when I led a group of youngsters um, for some walks in the uh, Peak District. <clears throat> when we crossed that, um, the bravest of them were walking um, in the middle and the most foolhardy were walking close to the rails and even on one occasion started climbing up one of the rails and were slightly surprised when I yanked them back. And, uh, but the rest of them uh, said, oh, you should have let him jump. It would have served him right. Um, anyway, that's the beauty of this. Now, the daft thing about this is there was the great objection to it being built. Well, of course, when the railway itself closed, well, because the quarrying was no longer viable, the mills had closed, and Beeching was doing his bit to say, close all these unnecessary railway lines. This is one that went down the same way that Ac uh, the Accrington line did. <clears throat> but when they did, wanted to close that, now the locals rose up in arms saying, no, we want to keep our, not necessarily keep our railway, but we definitely want to keep our viaduct because, well, because it's now become a tourist attraction. And uh, so they wanted to keep it. And luckily they managed to, and so people can still um, walk across it instead of go by train. So that's Monsell Dale Viaduct. You'll notice that I'm not giving you great, fantastic details because I leave you with homework all the time. You have to do any research for yourselves. Um, <clears throat> for John, um, here we come into Wales, Barmouth Viaduct or Pont Abamar. Um, and of course, not surprisingly, it's Barmouth, and that's what the viaduct looks like. I got carried away with postcards in this one. Uh, 23408, um, obviously the identification of the um, postcard from the point of view of um, reordering. And obviously the viaduct is a very significant one across an extremely wide res um, estuary, and an estuary that uh, fills in 
obviously very, very tidal. Um, but the cri critical thing about this one was that ships came up here. Um, and therefore, when they were building this, they had to make sure that those ships could go underneath. It's the longest timber viaduct in Wales and one of the oldest, not the oldest, but one of the oldest in regular use in Britain. That is assuming that the railways haven't gone on strike. 1864 on the Cambrian Coast Rail line. And originally, as I said, it was to allow the ships to come up, it had to have a drawbridge. I'm just sort of imagining the thought of a, there's a drawbridge and there's a train coming along and there's a ship coming and they're racing each other to see who's going to get there first and get priority. Um, I, I don't ever think there's been a sort of river railway road rage, um, but I could imagine it when you were getting to this. However, they decided by <clears throat> 1900 that they could do better than that. So they replaced it with a swing bridge, um, which I think is still in uh, position, though not very much in use now. It was so good was that, that I thought we'll have another one. Um, and this of course shows the drawbridge set up here with the deepest channel obviously coming through there. And I like that so much that you can have another one as well, showing the whole setup. Um, this last two years, they've been working on replacing um, any of the wood that needed replacing, and to which they are, um, I think the answer is quite a lot, um, but uh, all the way along here, they've been replacing um, aspects of the wood. Um, and they have to, of course, to wait until the tide's out before they can do some of the work. Um, and presumably the trains aren't running and so on and so forth. So there must have been an enormous amount of problem in doing that sort of work. And now that's what it looks like now. <clears throat> it's, isn't it extraordinary how when you have these photographs taken and most of the postcards, the sun is shining, the tide is up so you don't see the mud and the beautiful boats are happily sailing through without any problem. But you'll notice on this one, there isn't a train in sight. It must have been a Saturday. Down closer to you, John, the viaduct in Porth Kerry Park, you in Barry, you probably know this, um, more about this than I do, but I'll try. Here it is, and there's, built in the 1890s. This is all, of course, the period where the railways were doing well, industry was doing well, and therefore they had to get their goods from coal mines to the um, manufacturers. Um, they had to get their uh, produ uh, products down to the ports and so on. So there's the line <clears throat> that this was built for. And it was actually <clears throat> particularly to go to the coal mines that were over here. Um, nowadays, it's got Cardiff Airport near it. It's a very wonky line, or at least, and the viaduct is there. I do enjoy myself with these. I hope you do as well. And that's the postcard of it, <clears throat> the viaduct at Porth Kerry Park. Um, it was built, as we say, in the 1890s, or they started. It actually started... Uh, they finished it in time for the opening of the line. Um, but then they realized that there was a problem <clears throat> that some, I don't know which of these piers were beginning to tilt because the land underneath it, or, or sink slightly, because the land underneath it was not stable. So what they had to do um, was, and I'm going to go back to this, they had to build a line around it in the woods or through the woods, um, to uh, avoid the dip that they were talking about. I don't know exactly where it ran. Perhaps John can tell me. Um, and when they'd done that, they could then rebuild, I think it was three of the piers, um, making them more stable. <clears throat> um, this is, again, is a line that's still in use. Um, so it was, the land underneath was obviously somewhat boggy um, uh, in some way, shape or form, or was unstable in some other way, but it was a part of a park or is now part of a park as well. Um, and the net result of that is 
con uh, constructed of stone and 13 50 foot and 345 feet arches. Maximum height of 110 feet, so certainly you don't want to jump off it or to fall from it. When they um, had rebuilt the arches, then it opened uh, and all was well, and it's never suffered since, to the best of my knowledge. Nowadays, it looks like that, and it really is a park underneath. Um, it must be quite something, and it's still in use. It now is used for um, commuter trains, I, as I understand. <clears throat> I'm sorry, George, and anybody else from Scotland, I haven't got one from Scotland in this. I know I could have had um, one, um, but everybody's seen the, the one that Harry Potter goes over, so you don't need to see that one again, do you? So we're going over to France, <clears throat> to Vibre in the Pas de Calais, uh, right on the coast between, um, well, between, this is Vimera itself, between Calais up there and Boulogne down here. It was actually built in order to link the two, and this is the railway line that it was dealing with. <coughs> it was intended for local traffic. So it's now part of the uh, Boulogne to Calais line, and it now carries um, trains from Paris. But in fact, it opened in early 1867, but mail trains soon cottoned on that this was actually a very good route, or the mail train operators did. And so the Paris to Calais mail trains uh, used the route um, and still do, uh, or at least the main trains do. Um, it's the actual picture of itself. You can see it's very much uh, in the town, though the port as a whole is down to this side with the, obviously the channel over here. Um, the majority of the town is to the west <coughs> of the um, viaduct. So here's the um, sort of 1867 version or slightly after. <coughs> and this is again, built tall enough, obviously, so that the ships could go underneath if so wished. And um, uh, again, um, a rather elderly train, goods trainer, uh, which of course was uh, quite likely to be uh, a major use for that because commuters as such didn't exist, but goods trains did. And that was built and now it carries major trains and looks more like that. Again, the whole thing is narrowed. Some of the, I think this is taken from the same side, but I can't be sure of that. Um, but uh, only three arches. It's not a particularly wide uh, river, but nonetheless, it's the Vimera viaduct. We will get to some that are a little bit bigger than that. <clears throat> and this one, for example, still in France, Chaumont. Le Viaduc et Pont de Saint Roche, uh, now um, part of the Paris to Baal route, a very, very major route indeed. The Viaduc de Chaumont is, uh, and the line is this one here coming through. Um, the, this is uh, Chaumont itself, deep valley on this side. And as you can see, there are various roadworks also needed around there. Uh, in order to get things up to the right level and down to the right level. It's 600 metres long, so that's a little bit bigger than my three arches, and it's 52 metres high, and rather strangely, it's in three layers. <clears throat> um, it's in, obviously in the uh, Département de uh, la Haute-Marne, <clears throat> and it's actually on this called the Viaduc Pont de Saint Roche. Nowadays, it's more likely to be known as the Viaduc de Chaumont. Um, fantastic build, uh, in my view, and the same lovely little train. You gather, I like to have them doing their job with uh, a vehicle or something on top. Got lots um, of uh, viaducts in France, and I've got lots of postcards of them, some more than others. But this one, I think, is spectacular. Oops, sorry, go back one. As there is a, a walkway all the way across on one of the levels. I think it's the higher one there. I couldn't swear to it. I haven't been across on that. And considering what it looks like, 
I'm not sure I'd want to. Uh, I'd certainly be walking down the middle. Um, it uh, looks an interesting sort of route. Now, that's what it looks like. Now, again, this was, um, there was talk of doing things with it, not, uh, you know, getting rid of some of the structure, um, but they decided that actually it was very secure as it was, so it might as well carry on. And it does carry the main line from uh, Paris to Baal over the top. Uh, it must be quite spectacular coming out on that and looking down and seeing, well, yeah, it's a long way down. So let's have another one in France. <clears throat> when you think about uh, what there is in France, of course, you can think of many mountainous areas. This is Le Grand Viaduc de la Donnière uh, near to Clel. No, I didn't know where that was either, nor did I care. Um, so it's now got a different name. When I was looking for the places the, so that I could get modern pictures, I had real trouble with this one because all I could get was the old pictures because they've gone and changed the name. I've decided that was probably a typical French trick to try and fool me. And this is the line of the route. It's an incredibly difficult route. There is a, a YouTube of the whole route uh, along this line, which is quite a long one. It was built in 1878, part of the railway route from Grenoble to Vennes, and then on to Gap. So it's really in the Massy Central area, linking over towards um, the Jura, I think. Um, but anyway, this is in the Massy Central with Grenoble there, and coming down, obviously, uh, at some stage towards the south coast. Uh, but not the Paris route. Um, and that's the viaduct. Um, built in 1878, as I said, <clears throat> and there's the title, which they very kindly gave me, and they told me all of that. And I had to look for the uh, line from Grenoble to Gap in order to get an idea of what it's like now. You can see that, the, and this is only one of a large number of viaducts along this particular route. Um, so, a good uh, photograph from probably about the turn of the century. Um, now, I tried to capture some of the, um, uh, the, the YouTube thing, but I probably couldn't show it anyway. But this is to, uh, still, uh, I took this and stopped it and uh, took a screenshot. And this is coming over down the, the line and round that bend as the viewed from the um, driver's cab. I had the great joy of thinking, I wonder when they first drove over this in one of the old railway engines, what it felt like to be looking across on something like this and thinking, where's the line going? You know, it's, it really is quite frightening. If you just sort of go back and think about this, it's not straight. No point in that is straight. It's actually curving around the whole time. And there it is showing it, which I thought was good. I like that. And this is how it looks now. Still in use. That's why they could do the um, YouTube video uh, going all the way down the line. Um, it's quite fascinating. Well, I found it so anyway. I used to uh, spot trains, so uh, it, perhaps it's not surprising. So that's the Viaduc de Lauban. Please forgive my French accent. So if you've got one viaduct, why not have some more? Okay, we'll have some more. Let's go to the Jura. The, uh, and at, in the Jura is Moray or Mores. I don't know how they pronounce that one. It ought to be Moray. And this is the map of the area. Well, that's fine. That's not a problem. And here are the railway lines. <coughs> it's actually uh, a junction railway line, so it's two coming together. And you've got this, which looks as though it's the easier one to do, was actually the last part built. This little lot going all the way around there and all the way around there and up there was the first lot built. Um, it took a long time. Well, there's a surprise. That's what it looks like. 
And here you see the lower line with the train on it. Thank you very much. And round there, you can see some of the bits that are going up there. So it's gaining a great deal of height in not very much, and it has to go all the way up. There are tunnels round here and then round there and then round there, and then it goes up to there. Fantastic line, it must be. It's um, quite famous, apparently. It's called, <clears throat> again, built between 1865 and 1912. It took a long time to build. Uh, it was built to connect the Haute Jura to the rest of the country. It's called the Ligne des Hirondelles, and it covers 120 kilometers between Saint Claude and Dôme. It takes over two and a half hours to cross the Jura from one side to the other. Um, <clears throat> the lower line around here goes off and sort of disappears over here, um, which is really doing a cross line. This is the fantastic one, and that was the first one built. Um, I, I just think it's an astonishing feat to manage to build it. And then it's an astonishing feat also to maintain it because the weather in those parts, when you get into the winter, must be quite something, but it still runs. I think it's superb. And there it is now, still in full action, um, all, all levels. You can travel on all of it. It has no problem at all. Trains seem to have got smaller. And then we've got the Gölchtalbrücke, the bridge over the river Gölch. Um, this is one of which I know there is a stamp and I've got the stamp, but I'm not sure where I've got the stamp. It's one of those situations where I know it's in an album somewhere, but where the album is, is anybody's guess at the moment, Had, having a bit of a restructure of my system. The world's largest brick built viaduct. So we've had the oldest, we've had the one of the largest um, wooden ones uh, and one of the oldest. And now we've got the world's largest brick built. And this one is not surprisingly over the Gulchtal. Um, and the viaduct, as you can see, is named there. And this is sort of basically what it was crossing. Um, what used to happen was that the train would come along to one side or uh, originally the road, and then you got a ferry across or waded across or whatever, and then you climbed up the other side and then carried on. But then they built it. Sorry, I was running the wrong way with that. So it was a, quite a deep crossing. And when you see the bridge, you'll realise why. Um, there it is. <clears throat> Three levels at Chaumont, so the Germans, of course, had to go better. So they've done four, <coughs> built entirely of brick. And the, all the bricks were purpose made. So they had an entire brickwork set up or multiple brickwork setups making the bricks to do this. Um, superb manuf um, architecture, fantastic site. Um, I, it's really, you know, takes my breath away to think of a bridge like that. Built of over 26 million specially made bricks between 1856 and 1861. So it didn't take them all that long. Not as long as Chaumont, only 574 meters and not as high, but 78 meters high, but it does have four levels. And of course, there's got these two Beautiful, I think, um, central arches, and, and they, and then these two narrow ones, because of course they, uh, this support set up here is really to support those central arches as well. Beautiful bridge. You gather our light viaduct. Um, here's a picture of it close up. Now, if you look, there's the car at the bottom. That's a standard sort of car. Uh, of the period, um, I think there we're talking about the 1870s, eight, uh, sorry, 1970s, 1980s, and there it towers above it. Um, the thought of actually um, coming off that or alternatively coming out and suddenly running across that would be breathtaking. And there it is in all its glory with a modern train going over the top.
And the latest edition, <clears throat> and it's my last one, so I hope you don't feel cheated that it's fairly short, but we can always talk about more if you like. The latest edition is the Upper Mill Viaduct on the Huddersfield Narrow Canal. So I've come back home, so to speak, complete with horse-drawn narrowboat. And this was my friend who sent me this actually lived fairly close to it, but they didn't know that I collected viaducts. So here I've got one. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, um, this is a fitting um, present. Uh, so I count it as a Christmas present and put it into my collection, even though it's a Christmas card. So it breaks all the rules, but I don't care. Uh, this lot is for open class uh, um, Zoom meetings, I've decided. Now, here we are right back at the beginning with this one. Um, so here is your question. Which viaduct is it? Do you know? Do you recognize it? Do you know of it? I'll give Ribblehead. you this. Sorry? Ribblehead. It is indeed. Well done. Uh, I'm, I'm from the north as well. Sorry. <laughs> All the top people know the right things, don't they? Uh, it's do. Ribblehead Viaduct. And this one, of course, is one that was again threatened with closure. Um, they really wanted to close it down. It wasn't closed by beaching, though I don't think he would have minded closing that one. It was threatened later than that. And of course, it um, fought long and hard against that. Um, and the locals fought long and hard, which is just as well, because this railway is the lifeline to the top ends of the dales. Um, and it also, I feel, would have been an insult because down below here is very boggy land. Uh, if you know the River Ribble in this upper reaches, it is uh, slow moving, um, very f flat in its run. So that's why the thing is so wide um, and it's very, very marshy. And under here are buried some of the navigators who, when this was being built, fell off, died, whatever, were crushed, and they couldn't get them out. So they're buried in there. And I think it would have been, I mean, many are buried in other places as well, but I think it would have been an insult to their memory personally. Um, and so this is a little bit possibly of Irish workmen uh, uh, who uh, gave their lives so that this could be built. Um, I like somber notes. Um, to finish with. So yes, that's the end and something, there we are. Um, it is, as it says, I even got the engine number 48703 crossing the viaduct in 1966. I hope that's been of some interest. Keith, it was fantastic.